Late breaking news as we come on air tonight. Bear County deputies have made an arrest and a fatal stabbing. We reported yesterday the tragic case now being labeled as domestic violence. Yeah, deputies have arrested 27 year old Michael Gonzalez seen here. Gonzalez charged with first degree felony murder for allegedly stabbing a 27 year old woman yesterday. She has not yet been identified. The incident happening in the 3800 block of Cree Trail. Witnesses told deputies they saw the woman jump out of a moving car. Neighbors in the area ran to check on her and discovered she had several stab wounds and was bleeding heavily. Shortly after, deputies found Gonzalez's vehicle wrecked in the intersection of Salty Marsh and Kennebec Way. Gonzalez was found hiding at a home in the area. The victim was pronounced dead later at the hospital. And the other big story today, people recovering from the storms last night. Uh, not very warm out there today, Adam. Lots of clouds and another chance for more rain headed our way. Yeah, and to be honest with you, I'm grateful we have the clouds out there right now because they're limiting the instability of, in the atmosphere and it limits really the daytime heating that we have. So our air is a lot more stable and I think those clouds are going to protect us from a repeat event tonight. That's the good news. Also, another piece of good news from all this is the aquifer already up a foot and a half since this time yesterday. And it's continuing to rise. It's just going to continue to rise. So here's a look at some damage from the Wild Horse subdivision yesterday evening. And this is from Justin Horn. He was there. This picture was taken after the storm hit at about 1020 p.m. And one thing that he said that stood out was the damage on one side of the street opposed to another side of the street, including this right here, which is a fence post lodged in to the side of a garage. And he said what it looked like to him was something that was a little more tornadic in nature than straight line winds. And the National Weather Service went out there today, and this is the part of town we're talking about, uh, just south of Holotus, basically Braun Road in 1604 and just south of there. That's where we have a confirmation of an EF1 tornado we're just along parts of Palomino right here. Here we have it. You get close and right along Palomino path there. That is the only damage last night that can be attributed to a tornado. EF1, max winds of 100 miles per hour. The official report is still being worked on by the National Weather Service in terms of track width and track length. But right now we know that that damage part of Palomino path is EF1, max winds 100 miles per hour. We have some activity on the radar screen out west likely to move our way. We're not expecting a repeat event, but we'll talk about this coming up. Thank you, Adam. Our KSAT viewers have been sending us pictures and videos like this all morning long and throughout the night, showing those strong storms moving in Sunday night. Lightning lighting up the sky for hours last night, even as the heavy rain slowed down. CPS energy officials say more than 63,000 households were without power. I was one of them. They reported nearly 6,000 lightning strikes as of 9.50 a.m. today, along with 67 down power lines overnight. For those who rode out the storm in the Wild Horse subdivision, the damage from last night's EF1 tornado was bad enough. Still, their homes were among only 16 structures that were damaged in north and northwestern Bear County. Emergency management survey today found mostly downed trees and fences. Jesse Deguiato says even so, homeowners along Palomino Path still had harrowing stories to tell. The few minutes that it took to leave this much damage began when Kenneth Bettis yelled at his son upstairs. There's a tornado warning. And he comes running down here and my daughter, my wife, had already taken shelter here in our guest uh, restroom. Later seeing what was left upstairs where his son had been, they realized they and the family dog in here had been spared a far worse fate. Like a nightmare. It really was. It was a living nightmare. It was... Uh, it was emotional because um, you just didn't know what was going to happen, you know. Um, it just, it was really, really tough. While we were on the back porch. <laughs> then there was Gerard Peter Wright, who now says he and his son shouldn't have been out here soon after the warning went out. That's when they heard it coming. It literally sounds like you're standing next to a train. They were running to the pantry when it hit. Uh, I did not have time to hit the floor. It, 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 already, it happened very, very fast. It, it Peter Wright says he's convinced all this was caused by the third tornado he's experienced in his life. But it hurt no one. It's remarkable. It's a blessing. We will pick up and move on and continue. In Northwest Bear County, Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. 
And of course, after the storm comes the cleanup, but be careful who you hire to do that. Bear County warning homeowners to be on the lookout for scammers who want to take advantage of people in need, especially seniors. Our Garrett Berger tells us how to make sure you don't get scammed. As homeowners survey their damages today, Bear County warns others may be looking too. We'll see a lot of roofing contractors and tree trimmers start circling through the neighborhoods, just knocking on doors and asking people if they'd like to have their tree trims and things like that, or their roof repaired or roof estimates. Some may be legitimate, but the county warns others could be scammers, looking to pressure homeowners into putting down money for repair work that's not going to get done. If they ask for a deposit up front and then say that they're going to come back later to do the work, that's probably a big red flag. So don't fall for hard sales tactics. There is no deadline to remove things by or anything like that, especially the morning after. We definitely want folks to take their time and be safe. And do your due diligence. File a claim with your insurance company. Get some estimates. And most of all, check out the business you're thinking of using, whether through references, the Better Business Bureau, or maybe find a business through a friend's recommendation. And the Insurance Council of Texas says no matter what, do not sign over your insurance check when you get it. As they have the, they complete their work, you pay them in, in increments to make sure that their work is to your satisfaction. And if someone does take your money and run, report it to law enforcement. But the best path is to avoid getting burned at all. Don't let one disaster become a second disaster. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. A man who was pulled over then briefly led deputies on a foot chase before shooting and killing himself last night in far northeast Bear County only made it about half a block. That's according to witnesses who live along FM 78 near Walsham Road. Sheriff's investigators believe the man wearing only boxer shorts and boots jumped over at least one resident's fence before getting back on the shoulder of the road and turning the gun on himself around 7 o'clock last night. The suspect had been pulled over after the car he was driving came back as stolen. The traffic stop part of increased patrols in the area because of what BCSO officials have described as a surge in crime there. One neighbor we spoke with today had not noticed any increase in criminal activity. I haven't seen that at all. I haven't I haven't seen that at all. Um, you know, this this has been a real quiet neighborhood. County officials so far have not released that suspect's name. Three people in the hospital after a shooting around 3 a.m. today on the city's northeast side. The shooting happened at the Viridian Apartments on North Foster Road, not far from Seguin and Riddiman Road. When police arrived on the scene, they found three men injured. A victim told police they were going to pick up a friend when someone started firing at them. Police did arrest someone inside the apartment complex, but they didn't say how they're tied to this case. The men were transported to Bamsey and are expected to recover. A man is dead following a house fire on the northeast side this morning. San Antonio fire crews discovered that victim after putting out the fire at a home on Terrytown Street, not far from Judson Road and Interstate 35. Sarah Costa tells us what investigators believe was the cause of death. Looking at the damage from the outside, you wouldn't think a fatal fire took place inside this northeast side home. However, it wasn't the flames that caused the man inside to die, but the heavy smoke. The fire was small and it appears to have started in the bedroom where we found the deceased victim. However, there was heavy, heavy smoke, which most likely at this point, it appears that that would be what contributed to uh, this victim succumbing to this fire. Firefighters say they arrived to the home on Terrytown Street just after 6.30 this morning. Investigators say the home did have a working smoke detector, which is why the fire department says it's odd that the man didn't make it out in time. Again, the conditions were such that we were able to make it in. I have no idea why this individual did not get up and try to make uh, an exit from the home. Firefighters say it is not known if the man was disabled and are working with a woman who also lived in the home that was not present when the fire broke out. Most everyone stuck at home check those smoke detectors. It doesn't always take a heavy fire to cause loss of life. Arson continues its investigation. They were able to rule out that lightning did not cause this fire. Sarah Costa, KSAT 12 News. San Antonio fire crews responding to yet another fire this morning at the villas at Rogers Ranch Apartments on Trouble Creek, not far from Loop 1604. When those crews arrived on scene, they found the mailroom was fully engulfed. Fire officials say the roof collapsed and a vehicle was found under the rubble, but no one was hurt by the fire.
Well, there will not be a mayor briefing today since it's Memorial Day, but here are the latest numbers from over the weekend. Confirmed COVID-19 cases at 2,442, which is up by 50 since Friday. As for the deaths in the county, the total is now 69. That's up three since Friday. 79 people are hospitalized, 41 in ICU, and 20 on ventilators. More meat restrictions are coming to HEB stores. Today, the store announced it will be adding purchase limits to the brisket. Customers are now limited to one brisket per purchase. HEB previously announced limits of five packages total of fresh beef, ground beef, and fresh ground bat patties. Customers are not allowed to buy five of each meat product. Chicken, pork, and turkey, though, have been removed from the purchase limits list. Take a look at time saver traffic on this holiday Monday. As you would expect, not a whole lot of traffic out there at I-35 and Loop 1604 on the far northeast side. We'll keep an eye on things, but for now, everything is smooth sailing out there. Well, as we know, thousands in Military City, USA are honoring fallen veterans this Memorial Day. Today, the Lewis Air Legends took to the sky to pay their respects in World War II planes. Check it out. Three P-51 Mustangs and one B-25J Mitchell could be seen in the sky. One man says today is more than a holiday. It's a day to remember those who have sacrificed for all of us. It's uh, a, a nice tribute to the people who sacrificed uh, their lives and uh, their time. And our KSAT crew got an up-close look at one of the World War II planes that flew over our heads today. Hours before that happened, we spoke to the San Antonio native pilot who flew the B-25. Pilot Vincent Sosa shows us what he considers to be the best seat in the house. Really in the B-25, the best seat is in the nose, uh, the glass nose. So you have to get out of your, the cockpit if you're going to go there or whatever seat you're in. And there's a little tunnel you crawl through and there's still a working bomb site. So it's pretty cool to be able to get up there. Today was the third flyover of San Antonio. The first was from the Thunderbirds back on March 13th. And then following week, uh, Archbishop Gustavo Garcia Sierra and the Texas Hill Wing of the Commemorative Air Force delivered a blessing from above. Still to come at six, the pandemic did not stop others from around the nation. To honor veterans on Memorial Day, we'll show you how they paid their respects. This Memorial Day, Americans pay respect to our country's fallen soldiers. Far and wide ceremonies took place virtually amid the coronavirus pandemic. Ursula Perry shows us how lost service members are being remembered under these COVID-19 circumstances. Honoring heroes. The commander in chief, President Trump, paying tribute to fallen soldiers with a wreath laying ceremony at the Arlington National Cemetery, then delivering a speech at Fort McHenry in Baltimore. In America, we are the captains of our own fate. No obstacle, no challenge and no threat is a match for the sheer determination of the American people. But on this Memorial Day, Americans honoring not only those who sacrifice their lives for the greater good of the country, but to nearly 100,000 lives lost to COVID-19. In recent months, our nation and the world have been engaged in a new form of battle against an invisible enemy. Flags flying at half-staff at the White House and other government buildings in memory of those killed by the virus. And this Sunday's New York Times cover page, 999 COVID-19 victims' names listed together, much like the military men and women's names etched across war memorials throughout the country. With social distancing guidelines still in effect, veterans virtually commemorated. The United States Navy Memorial holding an online ceremony. Communities coming together as well. Members of the Berkeley Heights, New Jersey Police Department visiting the homes of veterans, holding brief ceremonies outside the houses. Former Vice President and presumptive Democratic nominee Joe Biden stepping out into the spotlight as well with a rare public appearance to Veterans Memorial Park in Delaware. It's one of the first times he's been seen outside of his home in recent weeks in wake of the coronavirus crisis. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. 
And there were some in-person open to the public events for Memorial Day in Washington, D.C., but with limited access and social distancing enforced. It was a rough ride last night for some folks here in San Antonio as those storms moved through. The good news is we did get some good rain out of that, Adam. Yeah, we had some good healthy rainfall uh, totals from those showers and thunderstorms. Even on the back side of that squall line, we had some good persistent rain. It's really helping to boost the aquifer and get us out of our drought. It called for a cool day today, though, with the changes that we had in our weather. We only made it to 80 degrees for the high. Now, after midnight, we had a half an inch of rain. Before midnight, we had over an inch of rain measured at the airport. But across the state, the only 90s were basically along the Rio Grande, Del Rio, Laredo, and even Brownsville. We had high temperatures in the 90s. Otherwise, cloud cover and some leftover showers kept most of the state cool. All right, let's take a look at the drought monitor. Notice the areas that really need the rain the most near Eagle Pass and then along the coastal bend. Now look where we got a lot of that rainfall. Let's put the radar on top of it from yesterday and right there in the sweet spot near Eagle Pass that's in the extreme drought. Got a second round of showers and storms since this drought monitor was issued. And here's another, another round here showing that activity pushing on through yesterday evening through last night and drought stricken areas of Texas got a good soaking rainfall. In terms of actual accumulations, most areas that saw the rain picked up between one and two inches. There were some pockets of three to four inches, though, measured by area rain gauges. And I mean, you look at San Antonio International, 2.41, downtown three inches, Chavano Park, 2.14. The red outline here within that, that's the aquifer drainage and recharge zone. So really the sweet spot where we want some of the heaviest rainfall. It's no surprise the aquifer is up a foot and a half already today since that rainfall. It hasn't even been 24 hours and it's already up a foot and a half. That's a pretty big jump. It's an active weather pattern. See all this activity pushing northward up the plains and well, that is all part of this upper level disturbance and that dip in the upper level flow that gave us our action, that little ripple. Well, now that's pushing northward. They have tornado watches, parts of Oklahoma and western Arkansas. We're seeing another little burst of energy on the south side of that trough, and that's another disturbance helping to kickstart some activity off to our west. So the clouds today have been beneficial for us. They gave us a more stable atmosphere. Don't worry, we could still have some thunderstorms and our atmosphere can still support some storms. It's just not as unstable and as juiced up as it was yesterday at this time, thanks to those clouds, large in part to the clouds. Some showers trying to make their way across the Rio Grande there uh, just north of Del Rio. And I expect a little more development out west through the evening hours. And that's where we need to watch. We need to watch Valverde County, Edwards County and that activity. If it starts to come together, it should be able to sustain itself here into San Antonio, say anytime between 9 p.m. and 1 a.m. And I think there's a slight chance of severe weather, but really the primary threat is flash flooding. We're not looking at anything like what we had last night. We just don't have the same setup. So about a 60 to 70% coverage of those uh, showers and thunderstorms tonight. Lightning thunder likely with that activity, but flash flooding the primary threat. We're only in the 70s right now, some lower 80s out there. And overall, we're not looking at a big temperature jump anytime soon. We have those storm chances through the night tonight and then tomorrow we'll start the day with a 30% chance and then a mixture of sun and clouds by the afternoon only making it to about 82 with a northerly breeze at 5 to 10 miles per hour. The rest of this week not quite as active out there. Right near 90 by Wednesday and Thursday. That'll be the warmest. Can't rule out a stray shower storm then some scattered activity, but 40% on Friday. But look, all those rain chances still in the forecast, even if they're small. Yeah, we'll take them. Thanks, Adam. If the NBA does restart, would we see the Spurs? Well, that's a big question. Would they restart with a regular season, a portion thereof, or would they go straight to the playoffs? If the latter is the case, that would mean the Spurs season is over. When we come back, why the Spurs may be left out of their restart for the NBA, and the Astros went back to work today. Coming up. Three-putt and make me feel good, please. <laughs> TV, TV, welcome to the match. <laughs> Six-time Super Bowl champion Tom Brady with his own wardrobe malfunction after hitting his best shot of the made-for-TV charity golf event to raise money to fight the COVID-19 pandemic in big board sports, but first. 
When the NBA resumes the 2019-2020 season in late July, maybe without the playoffs, maybe with the playoffs only, I should say, and seeding teams regardless of conference from 1 to 16. Now, that's according to ESPN. If that format is approved by the NBA Board of Governors, then the Spurs season is over, meaning they missed the playoffs for the first time in 23 seasons. Right now, the Spurs stand four games back at the Memphis Grizzlies, who own the eighth and final playoff spot in the Western Conference. And if the season resumes with only the postseason, the Lakers, the Clippers, the Nuggets, Utah, OKC, Houston, Dallas, and Memphis – would be in. Everyone else would be out in the West. The obvious advantage to this plan is that the NBA would only have to worry about 16 teams reporting to the wide world of sports complex at Disney. The proposed site for the league's return with three arenas and plenty of hotel space for players and staff. The Houston Astros have opened Minute Maid Park and their spring training facility in West Palm Beach, Florida for workouts beginning today. New general manager James Click announcing the facilities will be open for individual workouts and no more than six players at a time at each facility in staggered sessions that includes treatment sessions with staff. The Astros were able to open only after getting approval from Major League Baseball, the two state and local governmental agencies, and the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. The workouts will take place with strict guidelines and protocols and include temperature screenings before anyone enters either facility no group workouts and each player will be assigned his own set of baseballs. This opening is the first step in baseball getting back to business after it was shut down in March during spring training. I want Tom Brady. I ain't gonna lie. Hey Tom, how many shots you want? This Chuck. Chuck. Come on, man. I'm gonna give you some shots, man. I want All some right. of you. Gotta get going. Chuck, I've been focusing on football, bro. <laughs> <laughs> trying to win a Super Bowl, man. Charles Barkley had been giving now Bucks quarterback Tom Brady a lot of grief during the Champions for Charity made for TV golf event for each his partner Phil Mickelson going up against Tiger Woods and Peyton Manning. In fact, Mickelson and Brady were down three strokes when Brady delivered his best shot of the tournament on seven, landing his approach shot on the green with a backspin that finds the hole. Now, Barkley had already promised an extra $50,000 donation that the six-time Super Bowl champion could just find a green on a par three, and Brooks Kepka chimed in with an additional $100,000 if Brady would just par a hole. He shut everyone up, but split his pants and broke his microphone, and it was all for charity. In the end, Tiger Woods only needed to two-putt to win the tournament, but they gave him the gimme at the end of this one for the one-stroke victory. I was a little nervous, a little tight, the front nine, and my man kept us in there, and the back nine, he really shined and hit some great shots, and we made a run and um, came really close. No one that... $20 million was raised and helping people that are really going through tough times. Uh, it was an honor for Tom and I both to be yeah, invited absolutely. by Phil and Tiger to play in this match and uh, really something I'll always remember and yeah. cherish. Yeah, their original goal was $10 million and they doubled that. Unbelievable. That's I'm great. sure Tom Brady can afford a new pair of pants. He had one already. <laughs> that was good. Back up. <laughs> we'll be right back. Well, communities across the country are trying to navigate how to safely reopen as officials in some cities struggle to enforce their social distancing rules. ABC's Megan Teresian is in San Diego with the latest. This Memorial Day weekend, the first real test to see how communities handle keeping people safe while reopening. In some cases, social distancing being completely ignored. Like this pool party in the Lake of the Ozarks, Missouri, with dozens of people without masks. There's two people out the sunroof throwing money. Or this street in Daytona Beach, Florida, packed with people. Police there saying they're getting frustrated by the lack of social distancing. This type of behavior is unacceptable. What is typically one of the busiest travel weekends is much slower this year. People shifting summer plans, many saying they will postpone vacations until 2021. But TSA says travel is inching up. They screened 350,000 passengers on Friday. That is the highest number of passengers screened since March 22nd. But it's still 88% down from the same time last year. And this morning, just two days after North Carolina reported its highest one-day number yet, with over 1,100 new COVID-19 cases, President Trump tweeting a stark warning to the state's Democratic governor, Roy Cooper, that if North Carolina doesn't lift its coronavirus restrictions, he'll move the Republican National Convention in August to somewhere else. Vice President, President Pence Trump doubling down earlier today years. on Fox. But, uh, what, what you hear the president saying today is just a very reasonable request of uh, the governor of North Carolina. We all want to be in Charlotte. We love North Carolina. And while many places are easing restrictions, Eight states are reporting an increase of new COVID-19 cases, many happening as a result of community spread. 
Megan Tavrizian, ABC News, San Diego. President Trump is restricting travel into the United States from Brazil, one of the hardest hit countries in this pandemic. The ban takes effect on Thursday and does not apply, though, to American citizens or permanent residents. The White House saying in a statement they are, quote, suspending the entry of aliens who have been in Brazil during the 14 day period before seeking admittance into the United States, end quote. Before the announcement Sunday night, National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien hinted that the restrictions were coming. We hope that'll be temporary, uh, but because of the situation in Brazil, we're going to take every step necessary to protect the American people. We'll take a look at, uh, at the other countries on a country by country basis. According to data from Johns Hopkins University, Brazil has more than 363,000 cases, ranked second for most cases in the world, only behind the United States. Around America tonight, an urgent manhunt underway for a University of Connecticut senior suspected in two murders. Police across three states are now searching for 23-year-old Peter Menfredonia. The search starting in Connecticut Friday, where police say the suspect attacked two men with an edged weapon, leading to the death of a 62-year-old man. Now, Sunday morning, another man reported being attacked by the suspect, who police say stole his truck, food, and firearms. That truck was found abandoned near the home, where investigators say the suspect killed a childhood friend before leaving Connecticut. We're actively and continuously looking for this individual. We are investigating all the possible leads that we have. Authorities say the suspect last spotted in New Jersey, this black Volkswagen Jetta, he was believed to be driving, discovered in a New Jersey uh, near the Pennsylvania border. He is considered to be armed and dangerous. A boat explosion leaves three people injured, including a county investigator in South Carolina. Officials say the boat was being filled with gas yesterday when it exploded. The investigator dislocated his shoulder after the explosion blew him off the boat and into the water. The boat was part of a Trump supporter MAGA parade. Two other people were injured. Take a look at this. It's the scene of a midnight block party in Jacksonville, Florida, that was shut down by police. Before officers were called, several dozen people crowded in the gas station parking lot. Video from there shows people socializing and waving their arms to music in the crowd, uh, clearly violating local social distancing guidelines, which asked for groups no larger than 10 to assemble. No word on if any arrests were made there. High water is still blocking a busy intersection in South Boston, Virginia. The area got some heavy rain over the last few days, with the water hitting its peak on Sunday. But, it, but officials say that the water is slowly receding, already down four inches hours after the rain stopped. To politics now, the presumptive Democratic nominee for president, Joe Biden, won the Hawaii primary on Saturday. The former vice president won the primary with 63 percent of the vote. Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders had 37 percent and is the only other candidate to earn delegates for the national convention. Estimates show Biden still needs 440 delegates to clinch the nomination outright before the convention. Joe Biden is the only Democratic candidate left in the race after Senator Sanders dropped out last month. Still to come on the news at 6. See how a South San ISD program is helping students with their mental health during the coronavirus pandemic. But first, did you know there were height restrictions to become a pilot in the Air Force? No shorter than 5'4 or taller than 6'5. That's until now. The Air Force is now scrapping those height requirements. Removing that minimum requirement is an especially big win for women, considering the average height for women in their 20s is just under 5'4. So instead of looking at height as a standard, the Air Force says they'll focus more on scientific methods. It is a new way for students, parents, and staff to be able to take advantage of free mental health resources. The Care Zone pilot program began this school year at South San ISD. Erica Hernandez spoke with students who say this ongoing pandemic, with the ongoing pandemic, the need for the program is growing. The spring semester has been one nobody could have ever expected. The coronavirus pandemic closed down schools and left students, their parents, and staff wondering what was next. South San ISD's new pilot program, The Care Zone, has been working hard to make sure those who needed it still had access to mental health resources. We are able to still provide the counseling to all of our clients that we saw at The Care Zone in the same way that we saw them before. But we also have enhanced our program where we not only see the students, we have a hotline for the parents that goes directly to our program director there. 
The CARE Zone was a student-backed initiative that they knew was needed in their community. In the past six months, the CARE Zone has seen over 1,300 community members from South San ISD. I feel that in this time especially that these services are much needed because uh, it gives people a sense of space to just be them and like really try to figure out who they are again in these certain times. The students involved with the Care Zone continue to enrich others and provide support for each other and their classmates meeting weekly on Zoom. Mm -hmm. And I enjoy that because usually I don't really have anyone to talk to except for my parents, you know, so it's nice to like talk to them and just have a normal conversation. Now, as we get into the summer, the Care Zone will stay open and the need for assistance will continue to be met. It's great that it's in our community and the people that are there are actually like relatable. And another thing is that um, we come from a low, uh, um, a low e economic uh, side of town and um, having these services free and available to anyone is amazing. South San ISD is the only district in San Antonio that has a mental health program such as this one. The kids involved, as well as the nonprofit partners who provide support, are hoping this is something they can bring to every kid at every district. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. Take a live look outside at City Cam. It is starting to be a little more light out there. I mean, even though the rain's coming again, Adam, I feel like it's not as dark as it was when we saw this yesterday. Oh, no. Yesterday was a completely different situation, and our atmosphere was a lot more unstable yesterday evening than what we have right now. So although we are expecting more scattered storms later on tonight, we are not anticipating a repeat of last night. Bless you, Tim. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> No. I know it's, it's fine <laughs> and also a less active pattern as we get on into this upcoming week. So we'll talk more about it and take a look at the new severe thunderstorm warning that's out in Valverde County coming right up. All right, in the buzz today, Pixar is featuring its first gay main character in an animated film. Out, a short film released on Disney Plus over the weekend, is a heartwarming nine-minute short. It is about a man named Greg who struggles to come out to his mom and dad. In a magical turn of events, Greg switches bodies with his dog, and in the end, he realizes he shouldn't hide who he is from his parents. All right, how would you like to try a virtual escape room? Mm -hmm. Sounds fun. I wasn't into the ones in person, so yeah. I don't know, but this might be easier. Apparently, a good number of people would. Business has been booming for the Rock Avenue escape room in Florida. The owners use it as a way to keep business going while keeping customers and employees safe. Sounds like a good idea. Here's how it works. An employee has two iPhones strapped on for the players to see what's going on. The employee works as the hands for the players and follows their directions. The company has two virtual games, and the company says people can play them from anywhere in the world. So Very creative. Yeah, I like that. Here's oh, my read here. Hey, you got <laughs> this man is delivering special tequila gifts to those who lost their jobs during the pandemic. He's been named the Tequila Fairy. It all started from a post on the Tequila Company's Facebook page offering to deliver free tequila to the doorstep of anyone without a job. What a nice man. He got up to 2,000 responses, and the post got so popular it's now expanded to several other Midwest states. Tequila Ferry. I think we need one of those here. This is my favorite story of the day. Cheers! It's National Wine Day today. Did you know there are more than 800 wineries in Northern Bay Area in California? and more than 1,000 across the state. There are five basic types of wine, if you're not a connoisseur, red, white, rosé, sparkling, and dessert. But when it comes to grapes, there are thousands of varieties. And you can mark National Wine Day by hosting a socially distanced or virtually wine tasting party, or you can just crack open a bottle and <laughs> see where it goes. <laughs> see where it takes you. I talked to my parents in Ohio today, and they've been cooped up like everyone else. Yeah. So where are you guys? At a winery. Oh, okay. Way to brag about it. <laughs> We hope you're enjoying some wine. Yes. <laughs> yeah, at least uh, at like a winery, you're outdoors mostly. Yes. You can keep big distances. That, that's good. Yeah, it's know. a good idea. Yeah. It is. Yeah. It's such a Tim Gerber line. Just crack it open and see what happens. <laughs> Just see what happens. See what happens. <laughs> <laughs> see where it takes you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I want to talk about last night, and let's give you a recap. If you're just tuning in and you did, didn't uh, hear the news that a tornado was confirmed on the northwest side of town, just outside of 1604, just south of Braun Road, that little circle there on the center part of your screen. That's where the tornado was confirmed today by the National Weather Service. Paul Yura and his team were out there and they they analyze the 
damage to see, okay, was it a microburst? Was it straight line winds? Or was it from a rotation such as a tornado? And right here in part of Palomino Path, okay, part of Palomino Path, that damage is considered EF1 tornado with max winds of 100 miles per hour. As for damage across the rest of San Antonio and the rest of our area, just straight line winds, okay? And I think one microburst as well. Here's a look at our pattern, it is active. I mean, you look into Oklahoma and Arkansas, that's the same upper disturbance that gave us our severe weather last night. That's moving their way, they have tornado watch in effect. We have another ripple in the upper level flow that's helping to kickstart some activity in Mexico and the Big Bend region. And this is likely to come together and organize again out west this evening, march eastward, and give us a shot of rain and thunderstorms as we get later on into tonight. I think especially anytime between about 9 p.m. and 1 a.m. So let's talk about it. First of all, we get into Valverde County. We do have a new severe thunderstorm warning in Valverde County. That's basically just north of Highway 90 there, and the main threat is hail, not wind, but hail within that thunderstorm just east of Langtree at this moment. But we also have a few showers starting to pop up west of Medina Lake. You may look off to the west southwest and you'll notice some dark clouds right now. That's nothing strong or severe. It's just some moderate rainfall, but it could generate some lightning if you give it some time. And also we're seeing a little bit of development here near the Bracken Bat Cave. Right now I would anticipate that being a little shower, but it is almost dinner time for those uh, for those mama bats going out. All right, so let's talk about our future cast. I like this particular model. It shows that activity coming together again, where we're gonna watch closely off to our west. And by 10 p.m. through the hill country down into Eagle Pass, by about 11 p.m. midnight, that's when it has it timed out for here in San Antonio. Yes, there is the chance of some severe weather with this, but we really think the primary threat is flash flooding. Our atmosphere is not as really primed this evening as it was yesterday. So we're not anticipating a repeat event. There could be some isolated severe gusts, but really flash flooding is what we're looking at to be the primary concern. We have saturated soil. I like saying that rather than talking about deep droughts. But unfortunately, when you add rain on top of it, it's like pouring water on concrete. It just runs off and can cause some issues. So. I know we had uh, water rescues yesterday evening. I'd like to avoid that this evening if we can, so anticipate some flash flooding later on tonight. Temperatures in the 70s right now. Some locations still hanging on to 80. We only made it to 80 for the high temperature today. That was it, thanks to the clouds. And I think that helped us mitigate a big severe outbreak for later on tonight as well. So 64 tomorrow morning, maybe a leftover isolated shower, 30% chance, then 82 by the afternoon and a northeasterly wind at 5 to 10. We don't get to say that very often in late May and even as we get into summertime is a northerly wind, but we'll have that tomorrow again. Wednesday and Thursday, partly cloudy near 90. A few daily chances of isolated to scattered showers and storms by Thursday through the upper through the upcoming weekend, but it's not looking like it's going to be anything all that widespread or a big deal. Won't be long before that big H parks itself over top of us. Oh, you know it, Tim. While we get it. Yeah, we should. All right, in case you missed it, coming up next. Sounded like you were in a dumpster or trash can with, with debris hitting it all the time and constantly, and, and then you could feel the pressure uh, when the windows blew out. The National Weather Service has confirmed that damage on Palomino Path in northwest Bear County was in fact the result of an EF1 tornado. Many living in the Wild Horse subdivision where that street is located have been picking up the pieces today. Damage estimates are still being compiled by emergency management and have not yet been released. It's not as bad as the tornado activity San Antonio had just a few years ago during Memorial Day holiday weekend. Along Palomino Path, where that confirmed tornado hit, it looked even worse by the light of day. A woman suspected of drunk driving after she hit a utility pole overnight. San Antonio police say it happened around 1215 this morning on East South Cross. According to officers on the scene, the woman drove into the utility pole, bringing down some power lines with it and then rolled over. Fortunately, she suffered no severe injuries after being checked out by medics. She was tested to see if alcohol was in her system. Smoking may have been the cause of a deadly fire that ripped through a northeast 
Bayside home this morning. A man was found dead in one of the bedrooms when firefighters entered that home. That's where they believe the flames originated. The fire department later tweeted there was evidence of smoking materials nearby. It's unclear right now why the man was unable to uh, escape as smoke detectors were working in the home. His cause of death is believed to be smoke inhalation. Quite a sight today is historic World War II Warbird planes taking to the skies over San Antonio on this Memorial Day. These views coming in from Fort Sam Houston. The display started at noon and lasted for about a half an hour. The honorary spectacle was hosted by the Lewis Air Legends along with the city of San Antonio. Take a look outside at Time Saver traffic. You are looking at 281 and Winding Way. Ooh, look at that traffic. <laughs> <laughs> it is Memorial Day, of course, and so a lot of people are uh, with their families or paying their respects to the people who have given their lives for our country. You have to get somewhere, now's the time to go. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and we are expecting some scattered thunderstorms later on tonight, especially any time between about 9 p.m and 2 a.m. here in San Antonio. We're not expecting a repeat of last night. That said, there is the off chance of some severe storms, and we also think flash flooding poses a big threat. Then a lot quieter as we go through the rest of the week, and not, not all as hot either. Thank you so much for joining us for the News at 6. See you back here for the Night Beat at 10, and don't forget Courtney on the 9, wherever you stream.